Hello, everybody. That's uh, let us know where you're watching in from. Also, um, what tribe you're from, what you're watching in. So, uh, today we got some special guests to teach you guys the men's grass dance and also some words that go along with the men's grass dance. So, you guys are gonna. You guys are in for a treat today. I know you guys have seen um, Repeat After Me program sometimes on Facebook on Powell Times. And we got uh, one of our instructors there going to be teaching some Cree words as long, along with uh, Chris Scribe, who's going to be teaching about the, the grass dance. And it's going to be really cool because he's going to show you kind of what you would wear with the grass dance. And then, he, then we got our, our Cree teacher going to teach you those words on how to say those certain words. So uh, just to say hello to some people um, from Pueblo, New Orleans, Six Nations. We got some people in the house. So thank you guys for uh, for popping in here today. So without further ado, you guys probably don't want to hear us. But this is uh, my wife, Marissa, as well. Say hello real quick to everyone. Danza, my name is Marissa. And I'm so excited for Dance Troupe to uh, be a part of this evening with our friends, uh, Chris and Julia. So I'm so excited. Uh, for everything that we're going to learn in the next hour. Mm -hmm. And Wendy says, repeat after me is my absolute favorite. I love, I love her. her. Yay. Then, yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Then you're going to you're gonna really love tonight. Tonight's going to be really awesome. So uh, we're going to um, change the screen around so you guys could see uh, uh, who we have here today for you guys. So. So come and share whatever uh, the language I can. I, I know I'm going to have some trouble with some of the words. So you guys just um, bear with me and I'll do as best as I can. Hey, hey, Moustas. I'm Konabi. Nam Koda. So I hear money and much of me. Dance, I'm a lecture prescribed in Tigasan. Get a sales in Virginia. So we're we're super happy to be here. Um, I am uh, I'm ecstatic that I get to uh, uh, sit beside this very old, uh, very uh, <laughs> elder uh, elder woman here that uh, uh, has a lot of knowledge and teachings, and uh, she's gonna come uh, help us out here with some language stuff. Um, uh, like, uh, this is actually uh, Nsegas, uh, to me, this is my mother-in-law, so I won't look at her until, uh, until she starts to um, act uh, non-Indigenous, and then I can look at her. So, uh, very, very excited, very happy to uh, be a part of this teaching and, and share. As we go, repeat after me uh, with, uh, with Julia the ultimate Facebook famous uh, uh, repeat after me Cree language instructor. Um, and this is gonna be fun, this is gonna be exciting. Um, I guess what we'll do is um, uh, we'll start with uh, just one word and just kind of ask you, uh, what's the word that you would use when you, in a Cree language to describe a power? Quatsamoan, Quatsamoan. 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 Like a power dance, pot Samoan. Pot Samoan. Or you can say, e pot, if you're talking about someplace, there's having a power out someplace else, you would say, e pot Samoan. E pot Samoan. E pot Samoan. E pot Samoan. E yeah. So the word, how would you describe a, uh, a Sioux person? Someone from Mosquito. So yeah, So how would you say dance? Me, uh, where I'm from, because the, the words are different from each area where you're from. You gotta remember that. Mm -hmm. You know, I am in an Uti Taski Makusagi and dance like just like a dance move, like um, you're dancing to music, and uh, say um. 
hip hop. Hip hop music. You would say <laughs> me me. Me me. Me me me. Me me. Me me. But if you're dancing power, you would say awesome. Okay. And if you're saying like say a sun dance, you would say imparisum. Imparisum. And then like a round dance is ipiti. Ipiti. Mm. So it depends where where the, the people are from. From my area, that's how we say it. Ah, oh, very good. Uh -huh. So part of this, uh, part of these teachings and part of this is that our, our, our Cree language, and, and you can tell us if this is, uh, I mean, this is true, but our Cree language is very descriptive. Uh -huh. It describes. Yes. So in your mind, you think of actually what's going on and what's happening. So this comes to the history of, of this dance that we're going to share here. Um, this dance, I'm, I'm Nakoda. I was raised Nakoda and I'm also Cree. I'm Nakoda from the Kerry to Kettle uh, Nakoda Oyate in uh, Treaty 4 territory, south of Regina. And I'm, and I'm also uh, uh, Cree, uh, Swampy Cree territory in uh, Norway House, Manitoba, uh, Treaty 5 territory. But I was raised in Treaty 6 territory, so uh, in Poundmaker Cree Nation. And uh, very, very proud of uh, all of those communities that I call home. Uh, my, <clears throat> I was raised by my grandmother and my grandmother, um, very strong, uh, Nakota teacher, uh, and one of the original dances for the Ocheti Shakoi, uh, the, 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 the Sioux people was this, uh, understanding of this grass dance. And this was one of the first dances that came and associated with Powell was that grass dance. And when we came up to... Uh, deliver this and trade it and uh, share it with our relatives, uh, our, 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 our Shihia relatives, our Cree relatives. Uh, they describe this dance in a descriptive way as the Sioux dance, that the Sioux wear, but they were describing this grass dance. And there's a whole bunch of parts and meanings to all of this dance, and there's no way that we would ever really just be able to get through it in one hour. Uh, but we're so excited here um, to add language as well as history, as well as sharing some dance with everybody uh, that's listening here. And um, I'm excited for this because I never actually uh, got a chance to do this before. Um, usually, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, my mother-in-law and I, and Sugus and I, we don't get along. And uh, you know, she, you know. Uh, don't we always argue back and forth, uh, you know, but uh, we're going to remain kind and uh, uh, nice to one another as we talk. About. I'm just I'm teasing her because we always get along pretty good. So um, we'll start with um, with a little bit of history. OK, and a little bit of uh, uh, the origination of this dance and where it comes from. And uh, you have to understand that a lot of what we have. Uh, as indigenous people uh, was gifted to us, uh, you know, whether it's from somebody gifting us something beautiful, whether it's the creator gifting us with dreams, uh, you know, whether it's uh, uh, these songs that come to us from our ancestors and, and some of that stuff, we, we're gifted a lot of what we have. And because we're gifted these things, we don't own them. There's no ownership on it. Uh, it's a gift that we have to share with one another. So that's my first question to uh, uh, Miss Repeat after me <laughs> is, um, how would we say gift in the Cree language? Like, um, where, like the, the gift, like say, when I was growing up, uh, the gift is imiat, you're giving them imiat, something. Just giving them something, but say you got a Christmas gift, and and then oh, we have put the moin. We would say we have put the moin. That's like a, a, a the gift of a Christmas gift. But if you're giving somebody something this sacred, you would say I'm gonna give you this. Give you this. Yeah, yeah. But like a Christmas gift, like would be we have keep we have put the moin. If we have put the money, like, what, like it's like, what are you hanging? If you really describe that word, yeah. what are you gonna hang me? Like, you know? Yeah. yeah like, so I mean, that goes to uh, a story I have about my mother-in-law giving a Christmas gift. She has her first <laughs> granddaughter at uh, Christmas time. 
Her first granddaughter got a great big uh, toy castle. It was probably about this high to the ground, and all the other grandkids got socks, you know. So Don't believe that's kind of what we go with, I guess, right there. Don't believe <laughs> okay. I love all my <laughs> Yeah, but uh, we know who she loved the most that <laughs> Christmas. So that's how we say gift. I mean, that's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. There's different uh, ways. There's Christmas gifts. And then there's something very sacred that's given to us. And and uh, how do we say that again one more time? If for a Christmas gift, we would say, I'm asking me, what are you going to gift me for? Like Because I was talking about like the Christmas season, like a gift, a mm -hmm. present. But if I if I wanted to give you something, I would say you know, wow. I'm giving you this. Inuita. Yeah, Inuita. All right. So this this was uh, gifted. This uh, this dance that we're going to talk about, this grass dance, was gifted to an individual. And this is the story that I was told. And there's a bunch of variations on it. But go ahead. And another thing too, like say somebody. Uh, he gifted you this. But the other way you can say, Inuti asumitan. Inuti asumitan. Now you carry it. You carry it on. It's like, I had it. Now you, it's yours. Now you asumita. Okay. Yeah. But you can't give me stuff that belongs to me already. I know. That's just on my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that, remember? <laughs> yes. Okay. So so this goes to the story. So this, this gift that was given, um, we have to remember that uh, life it, it, on the land and life a long time ago was difficult. It was hard. Uh, we didn't have all of this beautiful, easy uh, uh, accommodations like uh, on the wall here, there's a thermostat. Um, I could really test my mother-in-law and ask her, you know, what, how we say thermostat and, and Cree. But we didn't have those things where we just turned the heat up. Uh, we didn't have these lights to turn off and on. You know, we didn't have these things. We had to work for all these things that we had. And it wasn't easy. And a lot of times we went through hard and difficult times. So this story that I'm going to share with you is about one of those hard and difficult times. But one thing that I was taught is that no matter what we face in our lives, no matter how difficult it is and no matter what it is, we're never alone. Our ancestors are always watching us. They're filling up this room. Uh, they're, they're there with us, they're watching us, and the Creator always has our back. And because of that, uh, we can always ask for that help. And this is a story related to that, that goes to the or origination of this grass dance. So there was a boy who was, uh, who was sick. He, he was, uh, you know, very, very ill. He wasn't able to do the things that he wanted to do. He wasn't able to just, uh, you know, all of these beautiful things that he'd see other kids doing, he wasn't able to do them. And uh, he went out uh, onto the land. He sat in this field of tall, beautiful grass, and he sat there. And what he did was he fasted. Uh, he fasted and he asked for uh, help and guidance to help him get over this uh, sickness and this illness that he had and help him, help him do this for, uh, for his people to share something. And many days went by and he got weaker and weaker as he, uh, as he went through this time. And then uh, he was so weak that he was on the ground and he was just barely moving. He could barely lift. He didn't eat and he didn't drink for a long time, drink water, had nothing out there. He was asking the creator and asking for them to pity him so that he can uh, get something to pass on, to carry it on, uh, what my mother-in-law had said and carry that on. And then all of a sudden, this beautiful dance was given to this, this boy. This boy, he wasn't able to walk. He didn't have this, the strength in his legs to do these things. But the certain song was sung. Um, with it was all of the protocols associated with that. All of the things he had to do in order to perform this dance. Uh, all of these things were given to him. And while he was given these things, he had this vision. It was like a TV screen popped up and he could see it. And as this uh, screen was there and he's seen all of these instructions on this dance and how this song was going, he's seen the grass moving back and forth like this. Tall, beautiful grass. And you think about the grass and when it's blowing and when it's moving back and forth in this beautiful kind of musical way. 
and it's moving back and forth in harmony and it's moving with the wind. And he sees this and he grabs some of that grass like this while he's looking down there and he puts it in the side of his, uh, his belt and he's getting up and he starts to dance like how he was shown. He goes back and all of a sudden he shares this story. He shares this dance with the people. And uh, that was one of the first uh, variations of this dance as it came. And he put these in and he mimicked this dance as it was going forward, back and forth. And, and it was meant to uh, inspire uh, healing, uh, good feelings, and meant to inspire good people to do uh, amazing things. And, and this uh, belt was one of the first parts of this dance. Uh, there's instructions on that. And there's, like I said, these are stories that can last for days as we go and we're doing a very, very fast, uh, uh, quick rendition of it. But there's, uh, the belt is one of the most important uh, pieces, it was one of the first pieces. And if you can see, this belt that we have here, um, it's for a really skinny guy. It's, uh, <laughs> it's actually from me, but uh, this belt right here, this is a belt. These pieces right here signify that grass that was put in the side of his belt and as he's going. So repeat after me. How would we say belt in the Cree language? Fakwati hun. Fakwati hun. Fakwati hun. Fakwati hun. Fakwati hun. Fakwati hun. And if I was going to just, I, I, I'm looking at the belt, I would call it miksu fakwati hun, the beaded belt. Miksu fakwati hun. Miksu fakwati hun. Miksu fakwati hun. But just the word belt is. Very cool. So, miksu pakwati hun is what we would say for a beaded belt. A beaded belt, yeah. And that's one part of this grass dance outfit is that beaded belt that's there. Now, for um, indigenous tribes on the plains, like the Sioux, like the Cree that lived on the plains and, and functioned off the plains, a big part of our who we are as indigenous people and who we are as, as nationhood is uh, our connection to our relative, uh, the horse. And I've heard you before talk about, uh, say, horse in Cree. Uh, how would we say horse in Cree? In my area, we would say misatim. Misatim. Yeah, in my area, we would say misatim. But in different areas, I heard them say misatim. 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 Okay. In my area, misatim. Misatim. So that, that comes to the next part of our grass dance outfit, which is called the harness. So a harness, when we put it on, you know, we put that harness on around our neck like this, much like a horse harness that we put. So how would we say this beaded harness in the Cree language? We would just call it tapskakan. 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 Because you're putting, you're describing it where you're putting it, you're putting it around your neck. Tapskakan. Tapskakan. Very cool. Tapskakan. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, the, the harness and, and, that we have. Yeah, we would call this because it's beaded. Miksu tapskakan. Miksu tapskakan. Miksu tapskakan. Ah, very cool. Miksu tapskakan. Is a beaded, beaded, beaded harness. Yes, yeah, but like for the horse, the horse harness is we have chicken. We have chicken. We have chicken. So those ones you, you do not like, but this one is top skakan because you're putting it around your neck. But you can hear, you can hear the uh, uh, the similarities in the yeah, words. Yeah. Like there's the root words are there. They're similar mm -hmm. to one another. All right, very cool. So that's a that's another part that's very very important to uh, uh, very important to this. Uh, so we also have um, here, maybe what I'll do is I'll show some nice, uh, some nice ones instead of my all beat up. Uh, so Pao dancers, you know, as you, as you dance and go through many, many summers of Pao dancing, your moccasins get all beat up and they get all these uh, shoes, these slippers or whatever uh, we want to call them. They all get beat up, beads get knocked over and different colors and everything, but We'll put those used ones aside, and we got some beautiful uh, uh, new ones here. And these shoes are, are one of our original um, adornments of what we wear. What would we say for 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 these for shoes? Wait, wait, wait. Hi. Um, 
Oh, I can't even think now. Wow, guys, you were thinking about it when you were thinking. Uh, can you just put it aside and I'll come back to it? <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, there's no uh, pausing the, the live show here. <laughs> and uh, our creed teacher <laughs> is, uh, uh, is going. But one of the, one of the uh, common terms okay, that's used it. by... Okay, go ahead. Papi, can you listen Papi, like it hides shoes. Papi, can you listen Papi, can you Yeah. Oh, yeah. Papi. That's hide. Yeah, hide. Okay. And just regular shoes, what would you say? Maskisana. Maskisana. Yeah, maskisana. So, Papi, can you listen is like hide, they're made of hide. Okay. Yeah. Maskisana yeah. is just shoes. So, we have, uh, we have these. Uh, Common term that a lot of people use is moccasin. Maskisana is uh, where that is derived from. Yeah. But these are hide made. So it's. Smokes. Love it. So those are, very, those are important. They go on our feet, put them on there. Then we have um, this, uh, this spur. This is. Um, Actually, uh, what I did was I got uh, my mother-in-law's hair, uh, her original <laughs> color of her hair, and and you know captured some of that hair, put it on uh, on here. And no, I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. But these go on the bottom of your feet like this, you know, and representing you know that horse nation, that horse culture, and representing some of that as well. Very important part of our of our outfit there and fur, you know, hair. Hair, my hair is Mr. Casa. Uh, horse hair is uh, Mr. Casa. Ah, Mr. Casa. Now, every, every um, dancer that dances uh, that dances power in the male categories, one of the most uh, everybody has a variation of these. So these are bells. And, um, you know, why you would have these bells, there's a whole bunch of reasons. You have them to keep in time with the drum group. You have them to signify and bring uh, Ward off all the, I mean, bring in all the beautiful ancestors to come and join you in dancing. They'd like the sound of that bell sounding. So if we had bells like this, how would we say it? Si, 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 go na prima trisno wa bio. Oh, you can hear the bells coming. Si, si, go na prima trisno wa bio. You can hear the bells ringing now. Oh. Yes. Si, si, go na. So, did you used to say that when you heard Santa Claus coming? Uh -huh. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so the the bells are are super important. We always make sure that we're wearing bells for the men dancers and uh, dancers that. Uh, I've been told, my uncles always told me, try and wear loud bells, uh, you know, to showcase, you know, uh, that you're able to keep in time, that beautiful sound, you can hear them coming a long way. And then also make sure that you're protecting all your family and everybody that's uh, participating. Now, uh, these are all the uh, accessories that go on our outfits. So this uh, piece right here, um, is uh, significant to me specifically. So one thing that's really important to, to tell is, or to share is that everybody's outfits, nobody's outfit is exactly the same. There's pieces on the outfit that signify who you are as a person. And there's very important pieces to everybody's outfit. Um, so this uh, scarf right here that, that, that I use, I only use this. I try wash it after every pile, but sometimes that doesn't happen. But I use this scarf all the time for a very, very important reason. This scarf here belonged to uh, my late grandmother. And when she passed away, um, she had a whole suitcase that was full of, of scarves. And I was gifted these scarves um, uh, afterwards when we, were, when we were gifting these things away that belonged to her. And when I opened up that suitcase, you know, I, I could smell, it smelled like my grandmother. And uh, man, it was so hard, you know, they smell these things that remind us of our loved ones. And in there, I seen this, uh, this blue scarf and, and I grabbed it and, and I said, I'm gonna use that so that every time that I put this on, 
I'll remember why I dance. I remember who taught me how to dance. I remember who taught me the stories and, and, and the reason why I put this outfit on. I remember all the times that we sat in the living room uh, stringing yarn or when she sat in there sewing ribbon onto different outfits for me growing up. And that, that's, a, that's a, a significant part of, uh, of my regalia. And this scarf right here also has a name in the Cree language. How would we say scarf in Cree? For the scarf, for, like I said, for, you wear it around your neck, tapskagan. Even like a, a tie, that's a tapskagan. A necklace, taps. But, but the woman, like my kukum, my mom and them, used to wear a scarf around their head and they used to call it tapskagans. Tapskagans. Yeah, tapskagans is the one they were under tapskagans. Oh, very yeah. cool. Jack Stoggins. Yeah. So that's that's this. That's the one that goes there. Now, um, we have other pieces in, that are part of our outfit as well. Uh, we have the cuffs that go on our on our on our arms like this. You know? Yeah. So we have uh, we have these cuffs that go there as part of our regalia. So they go on there. Uh, we also have um, uh, this part here, which is a headband. So your headband gets put on. I don't know if you if you had a word for headband, <laughs> yeah. but you could say, just have to describe what it's used for on your time, like you know, just yeah. So that's I mean that's what we would have our headband, and again signifying just different things coming down. Um, that that part is there as well. Now um, we have a couple of uh, a couple of things here. This is what um, this is called actually a roach spreader. And uh, it goes in your roach, holds your feathers as they stand up on your on your regalia. Uh, again, specific to who you are, uh, all of these things have different meanings. Um, so these are porcupine scalp lock. Uh, my adopted mom beaded that for me. And this represents our battles and our warriors that we went to war with. Um, in 1989, I was just a young boy and I was in a, I was in a tornado outside in a tornado and uh, you know it destroyed our house it destroyed where we lived my grandmother and i and one of the things that we found and we retained was a drum uh, a hand drum that was made and it was uh, cracked and it was ripped in the tornado but it was uh, the hide was still there and we kept it for many years and then uh, just recently i found that drum and that hide and it was uh, all kind of beat up and i asked uh, you know about that drum and how old it was and here in uh, 1974 uh, my grandmother and my 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 musha my grandfather uh, they scraped this hide uh, they tanned it and they made a bunch of drums for the residents in uh, where they lived in uh, Portage La Prairie and this is the drum that they kept so I, I used the hide that was that was remaining on there because the drum was uh, wasn't being able to use anymore, and I made myself a, a rope spreader that I'm gonna keep for for myself and my my family, and then also made all of these little um, uh, things that hold my feathers as well on here. So this rawhide is all part of that. It's really cool because um, my grandfather and my grandmother made this. They created this. And 1975 was a long time ago. If you if you subtract uh, 2020 minus 1975, you'll get the date. So you kids that are listening, you can do that as part of your math, uh, your math uh, assignments for the day. Um, <clears throat> so this is gonna go now until onto uh, the next part of our of our what we're doing here. So these are. Way back in the day, in uh, in the seventies, uh, my mother-in-law used to wear these kinds of pants. Uh, uh, but they were really skinny on the top, you know, real skinny, like skin tight. And then they'd go out like this into a, what's called a bell bottom. Yeah. So my mother-in-law used to wear these kind, and uh, I they asked me, "What kind of pants do you want?" And I said, "You know, I want to honor my mother-in-law, and I want to honor." Uh, her time in the 70s and flower power and all that stuff. And I, 
and I'd like to and Google flower power uh, kids <laughs> find out what that is or ask your parents you know but uh, bell bottoms how would we say pants in Cree? Mitas. Mitas. Now mitas and these bell bottoms you know <laughs> that you used to wear you probably still have a few of them but how would you say bell bottoms maybe? Or something like Flared out. Flared out. <laughs> so any word. So there is um, one thing that's really cool about uh, indigenous languages is there's if you can describe it, there's a Cree word yes, for it. Yeah. There's no such thing as uh, a word that doesn't exist in the Cree language. If you can describe something, you can make a Cree word yeah, for it. You just look at okay? it and then you just look at the uh, what's happening or look at the uh, whatever you're looking at or how it moves, you describe it like what it's used for or, or how that word is moved. Like say uh, for that pants, when you're asking me, how do you say like bell bottoms? You have to describe, okay, how do you say it's flared out? And then you just say in. Beautiful. Yeah. Awesome. So those pants that goes on there. Um, the next part of, uh, of, of this regalia that we would have is, um, this right here, which is a uh, which is a shirt, um, a net shirt. You know, you have all of these, and like I've said, Horus Nation. Um, there's there's a couple guys, a warriors that are on here, and um, a really cool thing is that uh, the Nakota people and the Cree people were all were relatives, were allies at one time, and and continue that allyship throughout our lives. So some of the words are similar. So. The word for um, warrior in, in Nakota is Akichita. That's our word for warrior in, uh, in, in the Nakota language. And what would the word for a warrior be in the Cree language? <laughs> Not the same. That's a man, but women can be warriors too. So the words are, the words are similar, but this is a, uh, this is a shirt. So how would we say shirt in uh, Cree language? Pagwayan. 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 Yeah. Ah. Now, uh, just a quick story about this. We have fringes. So these are eagle feathers, eagle plumes that are on here. Um, there's, a, there's a whole reason why you would put those on here. But what I want to spend time on and talk about is I want to talk about uh, these fringes, these rags that are on here. So... Um, that's a weird thing. We call them rags. Now, why would you put rags on this outfit and this regalia that you're trying to, you're wearing and you're trying to look good and, and you know, really style up for? But uh, these rags are very, very significant, especially uh, for me and my family from the carry to kettle, uh, because it wasn't very long ago in the 50s, 1950s, uh, that our culture, our ceremonies, our, our indigenous ways of dance and our, and our language and everything like that we celebrated and who we are was illegal. Uh, and if we put on our regalia, if we put on our outfits, if we sang our songs, uh, we, would have, we would get a fine from the Indian agent on, on the reserves. Uh, it, was a, it was illegal for us to celebrate these things. And what my ancestors did, my great grandfather, uh, my great grandparents and, and my Japans and further on down the line, what they did is they did them in secret. They had these ceremonies and they did these uh, cultural practices in secret so that they wouldn't receive uh, a fine because we couldn't pay the fine and then they take us to jail. And, you know, to avoid that and to maintain our indigeneity and who we are and pride in our culture, we took these and we did them in secret. And we did them in secret so that we wouldn't, we can continue on to know who we were. And because we couldn't have our regalia, we couldn't display it and we couldn't keep it out. And it was hard for us to hide this stuff. What we had to do is we had to use our regular clothes. So if, if I was wearing these pants right here, what my ancestors did is they cut the, the pants into fringes up to a certain point. And they'd make rags out of their pants legs. And the same with their shirts, they'd, put, they'd cut the rags on there. So they look similar to this. 
And they would, what they would do is they would use those regular clothes and they would use that and they would dance and they would still do the ceremonies. They wouldn't be able to have this beautiful regalia. They'd have to do it in secret. So I use this as a reminder for what my ancestors, what my great grandfather and what my great grandmothers, what they did to, to be, to, for me to be able to dance is they kept it alive. They kept us doing this beautiful thing in secret. And I put these rags on here to remind me of the sacrifice they made in order for me to put this on, in order for me, for my son, to be able to put on his regalia, to put on his, his outfit. And, and that's, that's the significance of this. And I always use this. I, I make sure that I always put these on as a reminder of that for me. Um, so, I mean, rags, how would we say a rag? In, in Cree, you know, like I'm just throwing it out there to repeat after me. But uh, uh, even just a, uh, a material like a... There you go. It's a small little pieces of material. And, and the same goes for these. These are aprons. So your aprons that you would put on, you would wear them and you put them around your waist like this. Lots of stuff that you put on your regalia as you, as you wear, the things that you wear. And again, all of these rags are on there, colorful and bright to showcase and to be proud. So a lot of people have traveled in different areas of the world and um, some indigenous cultures, uh, they have uh, paint that they put on their bodies. Others put very bright, vibrant colors. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, we use a lot of bright, vibrant colors. And what I was told as to why it is like that is A, it looks cool. I mean, it's right out there, but then it's also that we're not, we're not hiding it anymore. It's not secret. It's sacred, but not secret. And we put that on because we want everybody to know that we have this beautiful dance, this beautiful regalia, and we showcase that with these bright colors and vibrant things so that everybody in that whole place that you're dancing at can recognize how beautiful the regalia is. Um, so part of the accessories in our dance and what we do is we have uh, different uh, symbols that um, we put forward on our, on our dance stuff and what we wear, what we hold. Uh, this right here is a water bird. Uh, so there's a lot of different water birds in, uh, in Cree culture, um, but one of the water birds that's uh, associated with, uh, with my mother-in-law is from her home community, and uh, it's called a loon. Mm -hmm. So how would we say the loon as a water bird? Makwa. 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 That's where I'm from, Makwa Sagegan. So Sagegan means lake. a lake. Makwa so Sagegan. loon lake. So anybody that wants to... Uh, uh, send a care package to uh, <laughs> to my mother-in-law. You type in uh, box 185, uh, Loon Lake, Saskatchewan, S-O-M-1-L-O. And uh, she accepts care packages uh, from yeah. New Orleans. She accepts them from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> all, the, all the places. Just send them, you know. Uh, pause it, uh, whatever time that is on that uh, thing right there. You know, send her a care package, you know. She Gosh. borrowed these clothes Gosh. she's wearing. Yeah, yeah. Sigus doesn't even have anything here. Nothing. Yeah. She, uh, you know, and uh, so, uh, yeah. Oh, wait till we get how will we say that? How will we say that again? Jamax, eh? Jamax, so? Is that, is that the word we would use for? Uh... <laughs> so, remember that uh, mailing address. So this dance the kids. It's very, uh, very important to us, and and uh, we use this and <laughs> hang feathers from there. And uh, there's all kinds of water birds, and again, that's a whole other story that goes with that. Um, we're coming to almost the end of uh, an end of the regalia that I'll share uh, with you today, and then uh, we'll get up and we'll do some uh, we'll do some uh, exercises. Well, actually, I'm gonna sing, and my mother-in-law is gonna <laughs> dance yeah, uh, in front here. <laughs> Um, but uh, <laughs> we're coming to the end. So this this right here is um, so 
as I was growing up, so one of the things, and I know um, I've, I've heard my I've heard my new style Patrick talk many times about growing up, and uh, I joked a little bit about uh, you know not having uh, really lots and really nice outfits and stuff like that. But when I grew up, we 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 had a we had enough to get on a dance floor, and uh, my grandmother and I always made sure that I had enough to get dancing and made sure that I had an outfit to get out there. Uh, but it wasn't always like the deadliest, most awesome, you know, these, you see some other kids up there and they're like, man, I, you know, I'd look at them and I'm like, man, that's not a deadly outfit, you know? And uh, as I was getting up into uh, teens, uh, I stopped dancing from my teens uh, up until I was an adult. But when I was getting up there, I had a, I had a really cool uh, older brother-in-law who allowed me to use some of his outfits sometimes and I'd have some of that cool stuff. Uh, but I always thought, you know, um, when I get older, you know, I'm gonna make sure that I try and find and get some really good uh, regalia. And I've been blessed to be able to find and, and work hard for the regalia that I have and meet a lot of really cool, amazing people uh, that do this genius artwork. Um, everything that you see here that I showed you was made by genius level indigenous artisans and uh, I, I, I'm i not kidding when I say genius level because the amount of effort and work that it takes to create these pieces of this regalia um, is hours and hours of time and uh, not everybody has that ability to do that and not everybody is able to do and make these things. Uh, one of those artisans that have it is um, uh, the ability to make this uh, in our language, in the Nakoda language, is wapesha, this uh, this roach this, that sits on your head. And uh, this is made out of porcupine hair and not just one porcupine, but several. And you have to make sure that you find all the same length. Takes a lot of time to sort it out. Takes a lot of time to create it. Um, <clears throat> and it takes a very special artisan to make it. And there's only a few people that, uh, to, that are able to do this type of work. And these artisans uh, that make these things, um, you know, I know who they are and, and their relatives are their friends of mine, you know, V. Whitehorse, Tina McAdam, Rachel MacArthur, uh, TJ Warren, um, just all of these different people that do this uh, amazing work, Richard Street, um, creating these, uh, these arts and these forms to allow us to dance are just, phenomenal. And all of these things that we have and that we adorn ourselves with, uh, they are uh, an extension of who we are as Indian people. It, it's not something like Halloween is coming around the corner and a lot of people are buying costumes in the stores right now. A lot of people are going out and getting costumes. You put on a costume to be somebody else. Uh, like my my mother-in-law here, uh, she's gonna she's going to get a a, a costume uh, to, uh, as a witch, okay? Um, and my <laughs> so my <laughs> so my mother-in-law she's she's not she's not a witch at all. Uh, uh, she's very kind and nice and amazing uh, human being, um, but she buys that costume to be somebody else. Us, when we put these on, these aren't costumes. We're not being somebody else. Uh, this is an extension of who we are as indigenous people. Uh, this is an extension of what we are, of, of what we are and what we represent. Um, so any English term that describes that extension of who you are, regalia is a royal term when you put on royal uh, clothing. Uh, an outfit is just something that you put on and you know when you're when you're going out to different places. So you know, think about the terminology in which we use and and what's appropriate when we uh, when we describe these things. And mm -hmm. I, and I, I think like for porcupine, you would say kakwa. Kakwa. Uh, yeah, that's what how we what we call uh, porcupine. Kakwa. Kakwa. Yeah. And the, and the porcupines, you know, they're um, you would have had on 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 uh, Mersa Mersa's uh, sessions here and and some of the professional development she's done and, and different things you'd have quill work and amazing quill work artists um, that have, I have a little bit of quill work on, on a piece of my regalia here, uh, but the porcupine quills, 
our, our, our original uh, beadwork, uh, we would use all of those quill work to adorn our outfits and it's so much work that you probably just watched and you've seen and such beautiful work, but you can use the hair here that's on there as well. And uh, the colorful hair that goes along the outside of that is deer hair. Um, there's no deer actually that are bright green. Uh, so they actually dye them. You know, I always have to put that disclaimer because I get asked that question uh, quite often. And the uh, reason I say that is because I expected a question like, uh, does anybody have any questions out there? And, they, and I expect them to say, where did you find a red deer, you know? And this grade eight student uh, at a presentation that I was doing uh, quite a number of years ago says, hey, I have a question. And she put up her hand. I said, yes, how could I help you? And she said, what's the difference between religion and culture? And I'm like, holy smoke, is that ever a deadly grade eight question? You know, I was thinking about this and uh, on the spot, I have to think about it. And this is an important one for all of us. And I, and I, know, um, uh, I know that my mother and I and I had many conversations about this, but my opinion, my thought on it, a religion is um, how we pray. Uh, you know, and, and our action of praying, the, the, the way that we pray uh, to the creator and how we communicate with God and our culture is uh, how we live our lives as indigenous people. And um, that's the best way to describe them. They're intertwined, you know, they're together. All of this is culture, it's religion, it's how we pray, it's how we live our lives. So all everything that I share with you here today is, is part of all of that. They're intertwined, but if you have to describe them separately, that's the best way that I could do that. And um, another, another thing is for, uh, yeah, for our, our culture, Niho Mantunus can Papasi time. Your Niho Mantunus can have to come first in order for you to follow your cultures, use your indigenous mind. And, and Think that, indigenous. That's a really cool yeah. word there. And and you know, in our mind when we're when we're when we're having it, and this is really cool for um for all of us that are out there uh, that may or may not know, but my mother-in-law is a, her first language was Cree. Uh, that was the first language that she ever had. And, and because that was her first language, in her mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, in her mind, she thinks in Cree. And she has to translate that and come out in English. Yes, and, and sometimes when I have to translate it in English, my, I have such broken English that it's not the words I can't pronounce. And, and yeah. those are, this is a really important lesson, not only for language, but this is an important lesson for so many people, is if somebody were to come here from Ireland and their first language was uh, the Gaelic language or uh, the language that originates there in Ireland, and they come here and they say, you know, if you fight for me, well, I got that kind of English. <laughs> and they say it in that, uh, in that, lang in that accent, You'd be like, oh, that's a really cool accent. I really like it. But the reason they have that accent is because they come from a land base and they have a language that's different than English. And we think that's exotic. We think that that's really cool and we gravitate towards that, you know, because it sounds, you know, like really deadly like that. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law, it's the same thing for Cree language. It's because she thinks in that language, because she translates it and, not, and, and English comes second. And, and that's a really important lesson to learn. It has nothing to do with intelligence, has nothing to do with uh, not being able to, to speak properly. It's because you speak multiple languages. It's because you come from a certain land base that's, uh, that's different than the one uh, where that lang the English language originated from. So that's uh, one really important piece that um, I always like to share uh, with so many people because we talk with elders a lot of times and we communicate with them in English. But remember that if they're a first language speaker, they have to think in, in, in the Cree language, translate it into English. And another thing, like just to uh, speak a little bit about uh, repeat after me. When I do repeat after me, there's a lot of people, oh, can you write it in Cree? You know, but in my mind, our, we were born to speak first before we could write. So I would, I wanted, I want to teach my students, whoever is following the repeat after me, is you need to learn how to say the word. You need to learn how to move the word in Cree, and then the writing comes after. 
because we're all we were all born to speak first before we could write when we were growing up. Everybody, every human. Because I was taught once you got big once you try write that word, if I was teaching here and I said, okay, write a stamp. And then I only taught you once and I told you to write that. And then all of a sudden I took the paper away. Okay, how, do, how what did I teach you? you? You probably forgot it already because the spirit of the language, once that pencil hits the paper, the spirit of the language is gone. That's why you have to learn how to speak first and learn what that word means and know how to move it orally first and then think about writing it later. And that's why I do that with Peter after me. I try to help our people like simply how to say one word at a time and then they can start putting those words together okay I hate awesome I mean and that and that right there ladies and gentlemen is uh, uh, exactly uh, what we believe uh, we talk these languages we our kids you know that uh, that are just babies they're learning language they're talking and they're making mistakes we don't make fun of them we encourage no. them you know we build them up and and the same goes for when we're learning language as adults. We have to remember that we're learning at that infancy level. We're learning at that beginning level. And saying it and speaking it is the number one thing. And, and writing, you know, that can come after, after you're speaking. Uh, that'll help you move forward. And I know a lot of, I know a lot of language um, speakers uh, enjoy that writing part. It's after, though. It's a, that's what we believe, and we've had that conversation uh, many times. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to end. We have about uh, five-ish minutes or so uh, to end this thing. Uh, but my mother-in-law and I are going to dance, you okay? So uh, we're, we're going to get up, <laughs> no, and we're going to dance. And she is a phenomenal <laughs> jingle dress dancer. Um, but anyway, I have videos <laughs> that I will show uh, at some point in time of my mother-in-law dancing <laughs> Anyway, before I go, I just wanted to say Kisaki Nawao. I love you all. Kisaki Nawao. Say it with me. Kisaki Nawao. Love you all. And Muistas. Remember, there is no goodbye in our language. We just say Muistas. We'll see each other again or across paths again. Okay. All right. Okay. You sure you're not going to dance? <laughs> okay. Nimito. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> this is. Uh, everything's kind of around here and you know i'm uh uh usually normally i'm a lot skinnier but covid you know so we have to uh put on some covid kind of uh, uh moves here but what i what i wanted to do and what i wanted to share is uh uh just this teaching that i was told about this about this grass dance when we dance and you can do anything that you want okay so we're gonna first we're gonna start with uh this a uh, very cool dance that my daughter absolutely loves right now. And it's called uh, <clears throat> Savage Love by Jason Derulo. You know, and, and uh, how that goes. Savage love. Don't somebody, don't somebody. You know, like that whole piece. So what, that, that TikTok, you know, that famous thing, you know, how that goes, you know, looking like an angel, but you savage love. You know, like I'm, I'm a deadly singer, by the way. The thing about why I'm talking about TikTok and Savage Love and Jason Derulo, you know, the reason why I'm doing that is because they do the move. I don't even know if I'm doing it right. You know, I'm too old for TikTok. And they put the hand up and they go down and then they do it on the other side as well. Put the hand up and do that. What that is, is kind of like a grass dance kind of um, uh, understanding because whatever you do on one side of your body, you have to do on the other side. Now, why do you do that? The reason why we do that, the reason why it's that way is because when we're dancing, we're putting on this regalia, people are watching us and we have to make sure that we maintain balance, humility, pride, that we maintain balance between our, our mothers and our fathers. We maintain balance between uh, our identity and our culture. All of the balance in our life the, the, the good and balance with that, but the bad and thinking about all those things that we represent that whenever we're putting on these, uh, this beautiful regalia. Now, whatever dance it is, whatever step that you're making, um, you have to remember that that balance is an important part. Okay. Just like 
savage love, you know, just like that. They're doing it on both sides and that balance is there. And then we think about that balance as it, as it uh, interprets into our dance moves. And we're thinking about, uh, as an example, you know, we're thinking about that, that grass that's swaying back and forth, you know, as it's going, okay? So one move that I usually like to do, and I'm not a very, very uh, fast and, uh, you know, spin real all, all, all ways dance. I'm not exciting. Uh, I try to be smooth. Okay, so I'm not the super most exciting guy out there. That's for my brother Terrence. Uh, but for, for me, I always try to make sure that I try to be as smooth as possible. So we think about smooth and that's about balance as well. So coming on one side and I'm thinking about that, moving my shoulders back and forth and the dancing is going and then I'll switch to this side and then I'll do the same thing. Okay, so as we're dancing, we're doing all of those things on one side to the other, okay? So we're moving our feet like this, thinking about our, our, our arms and how they're moving. And then we'll move to this side, thinking about our arms and how they move together, okay? And you can do all kinds of moves. Whatever you're feeling, do it. As long as it's keeping in time with the drum, you move your feet. You can kick like this, back and forth. Put it down, kick like this, back and forth. And doing all kinds of moves like that. And the basic power step, one, two, one, two, one, two. Whenever you're thinking of what you need to do next, do one, two, and then think of a move. Spell your name, you know, however you wanna do it. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks to my mother-in-law for being an awesome Cree teacher and sharing knowledge with us. And I hope you enjoyed what we did here. Hi, hi. I'm going to ask Right on, right on. Give them a round of applause out there in uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube land. Uh, a round of applause is basically just a like, a share, a comment. And we want to thank you guys for, you know, taking some time out of your day to hang out with us. Hi, Karen. I'm so happy you joined today. We got Karen Hinton say thank you. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we got a Facebook user uh, saying thank you for sharing, guys. Yes. I, I really hope you guys enjoyed this. If you guys want more of this kind of stuff, uh, let us know. You know, write it in the comments, kind of anything else, uh, kind of workshops that you guys would like or online, things like this. Because I know a lot of you guys are stuck at home and you're, you're wanting some of that learning. And this is like one of the perfect places to do it. So... The, the two people that we had on uh, here, you could find them if you looked up Repeat After Me on uh, Facebook, and you'll find them on YouTube. We have it on our Powo channel. Uh, she has her own Facebook page as well, Repeat After Me. And uh, Mr. Chris Scribe, if you look up uh, Think Indigenous on Facebook, you'll see a lot of his content on there. Uh, he runs a really awesome uh, uh, organization called Think Indigenous. They, they you know, without, when they, the pandemic was a non, there's this awesome, they had this awesome uh, conference and people would gather from all over the world actually and they would come to Think Indigenous and they would learn. So we're hoping that, that can come up uh, soon when uh, things get a little bit more normalized out there. But So also it says here that it, the website is thinkindigenous.ca. So we have medicine bags available at uh, my office, so if you just want to message me after, I can hook you up with that. Um, a lot of, a lot of. Oh, while yes. you guys are still on, because there's uh, so much comments coming in now. If you had any questions, um, we just need to, we do have them here in our, our little studio. But um, if you did have any questions, like make sure that I ask. But roaches, I want to learn how to make those, but I might have to hunt for some porcupines in a good way. Yeah, that'd be an awesome, awesome workshop. Uh, I love everything that you guys put on through Facebook. Oh, thank really. you so much, Karen. I appreciate you so much. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Um, you know who wants to learn about lead singers and song makers. Song makers. Definitely workshop that we can So what you want to do is uh, keep checking back on the, on the Facebook. Read your Aboriginal dance troupe. 
page. There's a lot of workshops that uh, happen on there as well. Um, Will work. They did medicine bags, moccasin making is coming up, and we'll be uh, wanting to share that here as well. So I think uh, we're coming in for a landing here. So just want to say, uh, like my my mom said, uh, Sagitin, meaning I, I love you, and thank you guys. We appreciate you. Get that to me, none. And again, thank you, Drew, so much. I'm so happy you guys enjoyed yourself. Uh, the next uh, practice is in person. That will happen on November 10th, and it's still at Festival Hall. The only reason that we were at Festival Hall today is because there's construction happening, and then the space uh, that they uh, have for us wouldn't fit the amount of people. So um, everything will resume back to normal after this. So I can't wait to see you guys in a couple weeks and just stay tuned for all the other workshops coming out. Thank you all so much. Have a good night. We'll see you.